Hello and welcome to Sport Africa, a program fully devoted to all things African sports. Coming up in the program. Can you name the only African manager in professional English football? Well, you can now, Dino Mamria. If they go to the press, I've got this opportunity and, uh, and I'm going to make it as big as I can. Nigel Amos is Botswana's first and only Olympic medalist and he has football to thank for his precious silver. No, these aren't waves from the famous Bondi beach, but the car. Evelyn Atal Furiosi is changing the surf scene for women in Senegal. Footballer Kalechi Nwankali tells us which Nigerian international he would least like to fight. And who will sit on our special yellow chair this week? Yes, it's Armchair Expert. Hello and welcome to BBC Sport Africa, the show that brings you the continent's biggest names from its biggest games. I'm Isaac Fannin. Now, if you're a regular viewer of this show, you're probably used to us coming from the likes of Anfield, Wembley, the Emirates. But this week, we thought we'd do something a little bit different. We thought we'd come to you from a place some might describe as a proper football ground. <laughs> This is the Lamex Stadium, and you can say that it has a pretty special relationship with Africa, because roaming these touchlines is a trailblazer. Dino Mamria is from Tunisia. He happens to manage Stevenage Football Club. They play in League Two. Dino is the only African managing in English professional football. I am different. I'm Tunisian, I'm African, Arab. Keep it simple, keep it simple, keep it simple, I have a picture, where are you going? Dino Mamria is the only African manager in professional British football, and one with an upbringing very different to the rest. I was born in a tent in the desert in the south of Tunisia, a place called Gafsa, not even Gafsa the town, outside Gafsa, by the mountain in the desert, in the south of Tunisia where, where I was born and brought up. Uh, Every family will have certain animals, uh, especially goats and sheep, and my dad's time was camels. My mum and dad's investment is you get the goats and the sheep, and it's an income because you make them grow and you sell their milk, and then, and then you sell the goats as well and the, those animals to make some money to, to breed them again and do the same. Never, ever, ever play that ball. I keep saying it, we, we. To, to come where I come from and to make it, you've got to be obsessed with it. You've got to be resilient, you've got to be believing in what you're going to do, in your dream, and you've got to be prepared to come back from setbacks. Last one. Okay. They say that hard work pays off. Brilliant, different gravy, mate. Well, for Nouradine Mamria, known as Dino in England, this is only half of it. Go! He came to Britain after being spotted by a Burnley scout who happened to be on holiday in Tunisia where he played in the top flight. I came into a very good club, Burnley Football Club, in first division. Uh, I didn't make it because I broke my leg. And the easy decision for me was to go back home and go play to one of these clubs. It would have been easy for me. But, uh, but early 90s, there was a lot of Tunisian players who gone to Europe and they came back. I didn't want to be one of those players. I want to make it here. This is the home of football. If you want to play football, you play in England. You've got to go behind. If they go to the press, on top. Instead of resting on his laurels, Dino got to work taking his first coaching badges once he was 25. I know that uh, I'm different and I don't want anyone to be more qualified than me, more knowledgeable than me. If I get that chance, I put all that into practice. After his injury, Dino played across a number of lower league clubs in England at the turn of the century. His longest spell came with Stevenage, who were based just an hour outside of London. He made almost 100 appearances for the club between three stints before coaching them on separate occasions. For an African, it's super rare to manage in England. So, did his connections help? Well, I got this job, I think, because I was a player here before and I was a coach here before, so the chairman knows me, trust me. Um, I think it's difficult. I think uh, because, because there's so many, you know, English, European round, who, who's qualified and who's uh, 
we are different African. We are different, are we? So uh, it's, it takes a brave chairman to employ an African because you are di we are different. And this club is uh, probably the closest club to my heart in England. Uh, I take this club personally. It's uh, personal to me to make sure they do well and put on the map of the football in England. How would they describe you as a coach? Relentless. <laughs> I can see, that's, I can uh, see. That's probably that what they'd say. I hear them say that. I'm on top of them all the time. I always want more. Uh, rightly so, I think. Uh, I think no good settling for second best. Since Dino's come to the club, he's helped them survive relegation last season, and now they're vying for promotion. His background, and the work ethic that comes with it, seems to have rubbed off on the players. He brought his kind of philosophy that he wanted to, to, to impose on us. You know, he's proud of where he comes from and it's a proud moment for him and I think he wants to make the most of it. And, you know, I think that we're all together here and we're all kind of aiming for a promotion this year, which would obviously put him in, in good stead and also the club as well. Press, press, press. On the front. The 47 year old's appetite for football has made him one of the most qualified coaches in the game. He holds a UEFA Pro licence, something you'd expect from Premier League managers. Good, Donovan. But having a fancy certificate doesn't mean you get offered the top jobs. I haven't played in the Premier League. A lot of people got advantage of me, I'm not English. So you you got to know what's your strength and what's your weaknesses. So my weakness is that I'm, I'm a foreigner in a, in a different country. So I've got to be excellent at what I do to get noticed. It's an opportunity Dino is determined to seize. Every day, whilst at Stevenage, Dino Mamria is looking to be a pioneer, clearing the path for more African coaches. I think like I'm like anybody else, uh, just getting on with the job. I've got this opportunity and, uh, and I can make it as big as I want. And I'm going to make it as big as I can. What an inspiring man. If you want to see more about Dino, head to the BBC Africa YouTube page for a longer cut of that video. It's time now for this week's armchair expert, Juliet Mafua is in the chair in Lagos. Well, back for another thrilling episode of Armchair Experts. I can't wait for you to meet these four geniuses we have for you today. Without further ado... Hi, my name is Uche Ugoji. I'm an Arsenal fan, a grown-up true and true. Um, one of North London's finest. Hello. My name is Deji, I'm a Liverpool fan. There is only one red in the whole of England, and that is Liverpool, true red. It will be a Liverpool and Arsenal showdown on Amateur Experts. It doesn't get better than that. But first, let's check out the rules for round one. Round one, it's simple. 30 seconds each to answer as many questions as possible on what's going on in the sporting week. So I'll be starting with you, Deji. And okay. your time starts now. Great. And what is Liverpool's club anthem called? You never walk alone. Correct. Who is the only Liverpool manager to have also managed the England national team? Pass. Roy Hodgson. Which Liverpool player currently holds the record for the fastest heart trick in the Premier League? Robbie Fowler. Wrong. Sadio Mane. Two minutes, 56 seconds. I know. <laughs> Which club did Brendan Rodgers manage prior to joining Liverpool? Swansea. Correct. Now, from which club did Luis Suarez join Liverpool in 2011? Ajax. Correct. True or false, Michael Owen is the youngest ever to play True. for Liverpool. True. False is Jerome Sinclair. All right, so your time ends now. Uche, your time starts now. Okay. What was Arsenal's former home ground called? Highbury. Correct. Which Arsenal player scored the final league goal at Highbury? Aubameyang. Now, Sterling Ray. As a Wenger's 1,000 games saw so Arsenal suffer a heavy 6-0 defeat to which club? Chelsea. Correct. Which African country are currently signed on as Arsenal's shirt sleeve sponsor? Rwanda. Correct. Who is Arsenal's record signing? Aubameyang. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> Against what club did new manager Unai Emery get his first win with Arsenal? West Ham United. Correct. That was amazing. It's expected. You have five points now. Let's check out what the scoreboard looks like. There's still a lot to play for in round two. Do stick around. Wow, Uche really is an Arsenal expert. We'll find out a little bit later whether he's going to be this week's armchair expert. Now, six years ago, Botswana won their first and only Olympic medal. Bursting out of nowhere, an 18-year-old Nigel Amos won a silver behind Kenya's David Rudisha 
who went on to smash the 800 meter world record in London. It's really hard to believe that Amos is just 24 years old with the world at his feet. So this boy just grew up in the rural area and countryside looking after cattle and the farm with the grandparents. I lost my mom when I was three years old, never known my father. And then Nigel Namus became this guy now who is fighting with the world best athlete in 800, who is currently one of the best two in 800 and still hoping to be one day the world record holder. Hey, I'm Nigel Amos, Nigel Camelos, I'm Alfantino Amos, and I'm from the most beautiful continent in the world, Africa. In 2010, I met a guy called Mr. Mafefe. He was an athletic coach. So every time when I met him in the corridor, he'll be like, hey, I've seen you playing football, you are good. The first strike, I can see how you run through that ball. Come and join the athletics team. I'll be like, no, that's not my thing. I can't come there. It keeps on going for all the time. Every time I see him, and eventually I'm like, let me just do it to get him off my back. Little did I know that was my road to my life. For me that year, it was the goal was to, to just do well at the World Junior. After I won the World Junior, which was like two weeks, Olympics are two weeks after, before, after the World Junior. So after I won the World, the World Junior, I was like, actually, I'm going to the Olympics. And the funny part, I was not even on my country, medal, target, like, oh, he will bring a medal. The minister was even in the flight the day, back home, the day I was running my final. And then I just started in the race, and actually the race finished, I won with the World Junior time. That is it, the first country Olympic medal, and still standing. When I get back home, I was given a lot of kettles, a lot of gifts to come in, everyone was happy. Once my baby came in my life, things changed. It was no more about me, it was no more about what they did, what I wish I could have, no settlement. I wake up in the morning, I wanted to have better things than I had. I wanted to go to better school than I did. I wanted to have better things, everything that I always did. That time I was suffering injuries after injury, I, was, I think I didn't have a good enough support team around me in terms of uh, dietitian, doctor, physio. I didn't have a proper structure then to elite athlete level. But then after Rio, when I got to the Olympics, where finally I'm like, ah, this is my second Olympic. I'm much older, much more wiser. I should be the champion. I get there, I'm not the often hit. It, it, get, it hits me hard. I get home and felt like quitting. I had to take a decision to say, maybe I should change the place I am, change the divide and go to a training group, and then I have to move across the world to go to America. I think my greatest strength is my faith. It's believing that eventually things will come together. I think because growing up without my mom and all that, I always see my grandparents praying each and every evening. They had nine children. They lost all of them. They were still praying. And then I've been able to do well. I have injured a couple of injuries in April. They managed to bring me back. And then I did the fastest time I ever did in the past six years of my career. I feel like things are coming right for me. Things are coming together for me. I'm in the right path for me to be able to take that shot and see if I can't improve. I can improve for my personal best and maybe that'll bring a world record on my table. What a story. I absolutely love Nigel's positivity. That's it for part one, but when we come back, we'll be meeting a dentist who's trying to change the Senegalese surfing scene. This is Sport Africa from the BBC. Welcome back to BBC Sport Africa, coming to you from Stevenage Football Club, which is just an hour outside of London. Now, one look at the waves in Dakar, and you can see why the surf scene is growing there. Still, for one local surfer, when it comes to enabling the development of the sport for women, there's still some work left to do. On a 
We have a lot of surfing spots. In many countries, there is just one spot where you can surf. But here in Dakar, we have multiple spots. And depending on the direction of the waves, we can surf whichever waves we want. On a aussi ce qu'il faut pour pouvoir surfer n'importe quelle vague, on va dire. Je suis dentiste. I'm a dentist with my own practice, so every Monday morning I'm able to surf, and I'm very lucky there are still some waves over the weekends. And then I can try to also surf on the weekends. It's mostly men more than women who are surfing, but women are starting to surf. More and more Senegalese women are getting into the water. Hopefully one day we will have parity. I got introduced to surfing when I met my husband. At the beginning, I used to wait for him on the beach under the sun. But since I don't really need to get a tan, I didn't really need to stay on the beach. So I started to surf with him. When she was selected to participate in the World Championships, when she went there, it was a big source of pride for me. Because she started from scratch. It's been about 15 years of hard work, and the fact that she was amongst the ladies chosen to represent Senegal made me very proud. The objective? Why not Tokyo 2020? Why not? We'll leave all the doors open and we'll work for it and we'll hope to be a part of it. Let me give you a secret. When you are surfing, you don't think about anything else. Whether you have problems or are worried, when you are in the water, the only objective is for you to take a wave and have fun. Honestly, you don't need to think about anything else. Everything is fine. <laughs> what a woman. Let's hope we'll be seeing more like Evelyn surfing in Senegal. Now, how convincing are Uche and Deji? So ready to go down with round two, Uche leading five points and Deji having three points. So round two promises to be hotter. Here are the rules. Round two, convince me. You each have 15 seconds to argue for or against. Two points are up for grabs. So we've got an interesting debate this week, one that never gets old. You can call it legendary. Arsenal are a bigger club than Liverpool. No way. Come on, now you have to convince me. You've got 15 seconds to do that. Uh, simple, Arsenal, modern era, bigger club than Liverpool. I doubt many people know that Liverpool still exists. Uh, we're not talking about the old ages. Now we're talking about football um, in its purest form. It's all associated with Arsenal. Arsene Wenger is gone, but he brought the game to reckon in, in, in England. And, 15 and the rest seconds are is up, all right? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very sure you've made your point. Yeah. OK, Deji, so, Liverpool. OK, so when Butchie says uh, Liverpool is not known, recently he, talk, he talked to me about the, team, the game with PSG, so he knows Liverpool. Now, Liverpool is a bigger team because in the modern era, you say football is about winning trophies. I have gone out of England and I've conquered Europe five times. Just last season, I was in the final of the Champions League. When next are you okay, going to be Okay, DJ, I'm so sorry. Your time is up, 15 seconds. Wow, this is going to be a tough one. It has to be DJ. And that's because you made the point of Liverpool being European champions. I mean, you have to not only be a local champion, but you have to dominate in, uh, Europe as well. Yeah. And that's what Liverpool Great. have done. So two points for you there, DJ. Now let's see what that does to the scoreboard. So it gets hotter with the Arsenal and Liverpool showdown. But of course, there's still a whole lot to play for in round three. Stick around.
OK, Deji Inuche, we can argue about how big Liverpool and Arsenal are, but you both know that they're not as big as a mighty Crystal Palace, my team. Now, Kalechi Nunkali is a name that you might not be too familiar with. He's currently on loan at Porto from the Gunners. But this young gun could be the next Nigerian rising star. Yanacho and um, Alex. The one against Atletico Madrid. Kelly. Ego si soup. Nothing apart from football. Okay. I need a city. I don't even go close to the sea. Manchester United. Family. My brother, Mark and the Sean Michael. If the last gift Kalechi gave someone was a car, I need more friends like Kalechi. Okay, so it's crunch time for this week's armchair expert. Who will win, Uche or Deji? Let's find out. Welcome back as the final and decided round of Amateur Experts, round three. If you can't wait to know who the winner is, I can't wait as well. But let's check out the rules first. Round three. The quick fire decider. 45 seconds to push up your score. Remember, shout your name before you answer or you lose out. Your time starts now. What was Michael Jordan's nickname? Digi. Air Jordan. Correct. Uh, the South Pole stance is associated with which sports? Uche, boxing. Correct. Which European football club is known as the Old Lady? Uche, Juventus. Correct. Which swimmer set a record winning eight gold medals Deji. at the 2008 Summer Olympics? Deji, Michael Phelps. Correct. Which was the last English club to win the Europa League? Uche. Deji. Liverpool. Wrong. Deji, Chelsea. Wrong. Uche. Manchester, Manchester United. United. Now you can go oh, twice. <laughs> I understand for you, Liverpool fan. <laughs> now, Zinedine Zidane won three Champions League titles as a manager. How many times did he win it as a player? Deji. Deji. Two. Wrong. Three. No, one. Springboks are the nickname for which South Digi. African sports outfit? Rugby. Correct, rugby team. And that's where 45 seconds end so quick. <laughs> Deji, of course, you have three points. And Uche, you have two points. You know but, what that means, yeah, right? Yeah. Okay, let's look at the scoreboard. Uche with seven points and Deji with eight points. And you know what that means? Deji becomes the BBC Sport Armchair Expert. Okay, you can take your place on the throne, Deji. <laughs> I can't You've... do this Chinese thing. <laughs> Maybe I can do it with the chair. Wear enjoy it, crown. enjoy it. Spin it, enjoy it white glass. <laughs> it's not yet the end of the season, so no crowns yet. <laughs> okay, Deji. Six so today six. is Deji, tomorrow it could be you. And that's it, an Armchair Expert. That's all we've got time for in this week's programme, but if you want to get in touch with us about anything you've seen in this week's show, head to our Facebook and Twitter pages. And if that isn't enough, we have a whole website dedicated to all things African sport. From the home of Africa's only English professional football-based manager, goodbye.